Sandy, it's awesome to be in your home. Uh, it's always been a, a privilege and an honor to be in your presence. I just remember a long time ago, and I've mentioned this before, uh, 30 some years ago with Walker's Cake, you know, on TV every Sunday morning, I'd get up and watch Flip and I'd want to go on that adventure. <laughs> and the way he spoke and the poetry that, that he sang, that, that show sang, and the fish that you guys caught, and you were a big presence on that show. And I remember the first time I came to the Keys, I had to go to the, uh, you know, Florida Keys Outfitters looking for the hippie. I was going, where are you, hippie? Because I knew you were a hippie and you were. But anyways, uh, thank you for allowing us to come into your home. And walking through your home, all these great pieces of art, these Miller Dwells from all the tournaments that you've won. When you step back and you look at your home and your life, what is this? how does this resonate to you? fishy <laughs> yeah it does <laughs> there's something fishy going on here <laughs> i don't know i did cut my ponytail though um i, I don't know it's um when i'm when i moved to south florida i met flip <clears throat> after about a year and um i had no idea um what a treasure this place was it, it was absolute treasure and it still is it, the resilience has been unbelievable um we talk about the degradation and the volume of people fishing and things like that but there's still no place like this <clears throat> and um uh, i met flip he introduced me to uh, a lot of the fishery uh, the bone fishing the tarpon fishing the flats the everglades the duck hunting what, whatever and um uh when i when i moved from atlanta i had grown up bass fishing and quail hunting that kind of stuff and and uh, <clears throat> I would throw a little a, a popping bug sometimes for bass or bluegill but nothing nothing like what this is it's, it's kind of blew me away <laughs> it's um and it blew me away too it changed my life for sure yeah. but I was always fascinated because in those early years I think you and Flip and Chico had the same kind of turn of of uh of a lifestyle and a career and a, and a passion in that he was a banker. You were in the beer business. Chico was at Burger King. And all of a sudden, you all threw it away and said, well, let's go fishing. <laughs> Talk about those early days with Flip and your families and, and how this all came to be. Well, it made big changes. <laughs> it made big changes. I, uh, um, I moved to, like I say, moved in 72 and about 85, uh, uh, we had turned a business around, a business which was failing when we consolidated them. And, put and them what together. was that business? The beer. <laughs> it was beer. We had, there was a Miller distributor and a Paps distributorship, and neither had enough volume to uh, sustain a market the size of Miami to have enough trucks to cover it and all that stuff. And uh, we put the two together on the same truck. And... Um, uh, which was pretty unique at the time. Today, they got a million brands on every truck. I don't know how people do it today, but we put Miller brands and Paps brands on the same truck and were able to compete against the Anheuser-Busch distributor, who was the biggest wholesaler in the world at the time. And uh, the business was good. It grew. Uh, Philip Morris had bought Miller. And uh, they couldn't advertise Philip Morris on TV anymore. And they told their ad agents to go sell beer. And they were much better at ad agents than the beer people had. And they tore it up. And they came out with light beer. So we went from selling 6% um, of the beer in Dade County to about 40% of the beer in Dade wow. County. Wow, life was good. And I said, I'm going fishing. <laughs> Good for you. And moved to the Keys. Yeah. So you just packed it in. Yeah. So sold out. I sold uh, to my brother and um, built a house down on Lower Matacombe and moved down here. Yeah. Uh, but I understand, too, just prior to that, you and Flip, your families were spending weekends uh, periodically together. And he's, yeah, I, I guess the story goes, he said, hey, you want to go try this, this fishing? Or how did that Trans translate. Yeah, to, the, to our, our kids uh, were about the same age. Uh, Flip's daughter and um, and my boys, Drew and David, and um, 
Um, Drew became a fishing guide. He's a very good fishing guide. He's a tarpon freak. He right. he loves tarpon. And um, uh, but we would spend you know the weekends. We'd go to uh, Clewiston and um, bass fish and duck hunt over Thanksgiving holidays and take the crew and and we'd come to the Keys and fish the tournaments and. Um, I remember fishing Gold Cup tarpon tournaments with Steve Huff and his boys, Dustin and Chad, were the same age as David and uh, Drew. So there was a tackle store in front of Chica Lodge. And I'd stay at Chica with, and the kids would come down and during the Gold Cup, Steve would bring Dustin and Chad up in the morning and I'd give them all five bucks. This was before videos. This was before cell phones. I'd give them five bucks. And they would go out. We'd go fishing in the tournament. Steve and I would take off and fish the tournament. And the kids would go to uh, Albury's Tackle Store. It was uh, Island Rod of Tackle. And they'd buy shrimp. They'd buy $5 worth of shrimp and a few hooks and some wine. And they'd go to the dock at Chica. And they'd, the four of these guys would get on the dock and they would catch grunts and pinfish. we well, hand lining them. And they'd chop them up. <laughs> and then they would take the grunts and the, uh, the pinfish that they'd chopped up and put them on lines and they'd catch crabs about this big. They'd catch little blue crabs and finny crabs. And they'd get a bucket full of them and they'd take them to all berries. And they'd trade them for more shrimp. <laughs> so Entrepreneurals. So for five bucks, you know, they'd spend the whole day. They were happy as they could be. They'd take a break from that sometimes, and they would play gaff the tarpon in the pool. And they would try and take a towel, and whoever was the tarpon in the pool would hold one end of it, and the other guy was the guide. And the one in the water would try and pull the guy into the water <laughs> You know, it's the DNA. I mean, you grow up around this kind of stuff. It's what, you know, and take a look at Dustin now and, and your son and all the tournament success that they've had. Yeah, unbelievable. You know, yeah. What, uh, do you remember the first bonefish you ever caught? I do. And the first tarpon, <laughs> possibly? Uh, <clears throat> the first, first bonefish was uh, inside of Caesars Creek. This one with a fly rod. There was a... Um, a big power company spool on the flat that had washed up during a storm or something. And it was a flat right inside Caesars Creek. Uh, forget what they call the area. There's a little windy creek. And, um, and uh, I could pull the boat up and you could see fish wade, tailing something. You could wade to them. It was terrible wading. It was soggy. You'd sink up to your ankles. But I waded to this fish and... Um, uh, through one of Chico's snapping shrimp. The brown snapping shrimp was the greatest fly in the world at the time. And uh, and hooked this fish and caught it maybe seven or eight pounds. I was my brother, with brother Randy, and uh, took a f picture of it. I think I have it somewhere, a black and white picture. With a, holding that How many years ago is this? This would have been probably 75, 85. A long time ago. A long time ago. <laughs> Did you, uh, and how about your first tarpon? <clears throat> and what fish really maybe said, flip this switch that I'm going to be doing this for a long, long time? You do what now? Was there a particular fish that you caught, maybe your first tarpon, which it was for me, that flipped that light switch saying to yourself, I'm going to be doing this for a long time? Well, the first time I saw a tarpon bite a fly. I was toast. Me too. <laughs> the first time I saw it, it wasn't on the end of my fly, but I was with Flip. I was with Flip and Bill Hagley. Bill Hagley uh, guided and mated down here a little bit, and he was um, he was um, the manager of the Met tournament in Miami for a while. He was a young guy. <clears throat> and he and Flip were good friends. In fact, they won the first bonefish tournament, the Island Rod Bonefish Tournament together. And Bill subsequently bought an airplane so he could scout for tarpon. And unfortunately, he and um, Craig's brewer's dad, um, Jim Brewer, went down in Florida Bay and were killed in that plane. But the first time... Uh, that 
I saw a fish, a tarpon bite was with Bill and Flip. We were at Buchanan Bank in the pocket. <clears throat> and a school of fish came down the bank and uh, Bill threw a, a, or a yellow and orange fly in front of this fish, stripped it two times. Fish came up and ate it. I just saw the f fish open his mouth and his gills flare. He set the hook and he jumped out of the water. It was like, whoa. It's <laughs> like, this is over. <laughs> Got to do that. I mean, that was so long ago. And I, too, I had a life in, in, in a different world. Um, and I knew, too, that once I saw this tarpon bite my bug, I'd never seen anything like this. You know, the shallow water, the hunting aspect, you can see everything. And it's like, how can, how can you not want to be doing this? <laughs> I don't know. But, you know, then you came, you know, to the Keys and uh, tell me about, you know, Florida Keys Outfitters and, and your school. You've done so much to bring so many people to this sport. Tell uh -huh. me about your relationship, you know, with that, because you obviously probably could have done a lot of other things, but the, you got involved with the business, with the Florida Keys store and then the school. I mean, how many people do you think you guys have put through the school? Oh, thousand, a couple thousand at this point. Uh, I would think of that. We 30 years. This is the 30th year. We're finishing the 30th year of the school. And um, uh, <clears throat> uh, we put a lot of people, and we still get telephone calls. Somebody went to school 30 years ago. I need a new fly line. I need a, what's a good fly line now? I need a new reel. I need a rod or whatever. And um, uh, so we've been friends with a lot of these people. Um, <clears throat> but I, I, uh, I went to a seminar that, um, they put on, on the, over on the West coast. I think, uh, uh, Flip and Chico and Lefty Cray and Mark Sozen and a group of people put a seminar out in the Everglades <clears throat> in, um, uh, um, 86 or something like that. Um, and, uh. I had a good time, but I said, well, why, are, why is it out here? There's no guides, there's no restaurants, there's no hotels, there's one hotel. And I came back and I called the guys. I said, you want to do school? They said, sure, we'll, we'll do that. You set it up and get all the people there and write us a check on two, Monday morning after the school. We'll be happy to come and teach. So that's what we did. And we started, the first school was February of 1989. And, um, uh, we just kept going with it, kept kept doing it. Very successful for a long time. Do you find initially, you know, and I've seen this with myself and with others, that initially it's all about the fish and the environment and what we see and feel while we're out there with the early morning sunrises and the frigate birds flying and sometimes the eagles and the, you know, the beautiful mornings and the roseate spoonbills if you're over there red fishing. It's just all so compelling. And do you think that... There was ever a moment where you thought this might be sacrilegious uh, as far as fishing for these beautiful fish on a fun day versus the whole tournament scene. Um, and for you, was that dynamic hard to gravitate to as far as the tournaments are concerned? The, the tournaments, uh, I, I fell into competitive fishing with a passion when, when I started doing it. I was looking at it. Uh, Idols like Stu App and Billy Payne and uh, uh, Jim Hardesty and um, uh, all these people, Jimmy Albright, Jack Brothers, these guys. I mean, whoa. And um, uh, so how I got competitive with it, I said, I can do this. I, I can do this. And I, and Spent time fishing. Spent you know, spent time spent time casting. Could get home in the afternoon after work, and pick up the fly rod and uh, and it was a cat that lived next door to me. I'd go between the houses, and I'd practice casting. I had a piece of yarn, and I could make this cat pounce three times. I felt good. He would pounce on the <laughs> yard three times, and then he lost interest. He wouldn't do it again that day. Next day, he would do it again. But f three times in one day was the most I could get him to bite. Do you think that that was like feeling that? I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about the cast itself, too. But feeding a cat is my analogy to being successfully 
uh, or being successful in feeding tarpon. I have always used that analogy. It's like getting a cat to react to the end of your line. Yeah, yeah you <laughs> you reach out if once you once you learn to cast the mechanics and you begin to feel it. It's you're not thinking about a cast. You reach out and you're placing the fly in relationship to that creature. It's it's not you're casting it. Should I double haul? Any yeah. of that. It's just you reach out. It doesn't matter where the wind is. It doesn't matter which direction it's blowing. If it's over there, or it's over there. You just you reach out and you place that fly, and then you manipulate it and you induce that. You trigger that strike impulse. Right. Just like that cat. Yeah. Just like the cat. Just like the cat. You know, it's interesting for me. I was a young man in Aspen. And I saw this fly line going arcing across the space into, at a Wagner Park. And it, I rode my bike over, and that was my introduction. I mean, I'm sure you probably felt the same. I mean, the arcing and uh, the artistry of throwing a, a fly line is just magnificent. Yeah. It, 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 the feeling of it. The, the feeling of it. And, <clears throat> and you got the rods. If you look back, the rods were so bad. <laughs> the, the rods were so bad. The reels were not a lot different than they are today. I mean, the reels, they had a disc drag of some type, and they were bar stock anodized aluminum. Um, there weren't a lot of places you could get them or a lot of manufacturers like there are today, but uh, the reels were couple of them up there on the wall. Yeah, I see the wedding cakes and the Seamasters. <laughs> and um, but but the rods by today's standards were terrible. Uh, they were soft and soggy. Um, and the uh, hooks were big and wide. Oh, uh, the hooks were big and heavy, and you were always hooking yourself. People were always getting hooked. People don't get hooked as much as they used to. I mean, that was a, that was like a common thing. Pulling flies out of each other's flesh. Yeah. For throwing flies, people hook themselves all the time. Yeah. What was it like here, the fishery? I mean, that was a long time ago. I can't even imagine how many fish there were here and, and the lack of people. There was a lack of people. There, were, there, were, um, there was a lack of people. And the, the, big, the big difference, I don't know that there's a lot less fish today. If you look at different species, if you look at tarpon, I don't know that there are a lot less fish uh, tarpon today. But when when uh, these fish were migrating up the ocean side and some of these banks in the back, <clears throat> and there had not been a boat for a mile to disturb them, nothing had disturbed them. They were in a natural state for a mile. And there may have been 50, 100, 500 fish in a school coming up the ocean side. A string of school that just kept coming and coming and coming. But today, today they can't go 200 yards in a lot of places. They can't go 200 yards without being disrupted. So that's 500 fish get, get uh, dispersed and a third of them go out deep. They go out and go out <clears throat> where nobody's fishing. And nobody's going to see them. And a third of them turn around and go down in, uh, by the bridge and sit on the bottom. And, a, <clears throat> and the next thing you know, you have five or seven fish coming in a school instead of 500. So that that's what happens. You, you, they've been dispersed quite a bit. But you know what, what I've noticed here? I've started doing this maybe about uh, 35 years ago. And I remember uh, Harry Spears saying, wow, it used to be so great. And 35 years ago it was unbelievable. And, but with what you've done with the, with the school and teaching these people how to cast and how to fish and where to put the fly and, and the great uh, equipment that we have, we can still catch a bunch of fish, ironically. Because you think that they're so smart and so beat up that they're difficult to catch. But I still think that if I had anywhere in the world to go fish for tarpon and big bonefish, it'd be right here. It would be here. And yeah. that's a remarkable statement to see this place last and endure what it has. Yeah. It, 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 what have you got? You've got, <clears throat> you've got a, an estuary with the, the Everglades. <clears throat> and while it's broken, while it's broken, it's still working. Right. You know, it's not destroyed. It's on the brink of destruction, but it seems to be uh, the political trend uh, is that we need to take care of our water. 
all of a sudden. And uh, it's got to be a priority for Florida. And it has become a, flo a priority in the last few years. Uh, very different than five years ago. Five years ago. Absolutely. Well, I want to get into that a little bit um, towards the end because I want to still continue, if you don't mind, about all these early years with these icons, the Stu Apps and the Billy Pates. Um, what was that like when you fished home Sassa and you had, you know, Tom Evans was there too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and what was going on with the gold cup? Um, I mean, for me, that was a fascinating, uh, era. Yeah. The gold cup was like the world series, you know, there weren't nearly as many fans and there was no money in it, but, <laughs> but it was like the world series, of the Super Bowl, And it, it, this is, it was a very obscure activity or sport at the time. Very few people had any idea that you could you could throw a four inch long fly in front of a hundred and thirty pound creature and have him eat it, and you could subdue him with a fly rod. No, nobody had any idea. The, the mass of people that fish, and in relation to the bass world, and the trout world, and the salmon world, I mean, it was just a a small number of people, but it was too good. It was too good, and, and people gravitated as they could. But we, we talk about the fish are tough today, and they, they don't bite, and this and that. I remember days. I remember one day in Sandy Key Basin, and I, never, I remember another day between Man of War and uh, Oxfoot. These are two areas where you'd see lots of fish. I'm talking about fish, I'm talking about thousands of fish in a day, in a tide. And I remember casting, <clears throat> casting at fish for four hours, changing flies, casting at fish for four hours with maybe a few minutes between them. Not getting a look, not even getting a, a, a look at the fish. And I know <laughs> it wasn't that bad. I mean, <laughs> I know they had to see the fly. But there are times that these fish are just not eating. They're, they're certainly not feeding when they're migrating the ocean. They'd starve to death. But it's just like anything else. You walk into a, a, a you're at a cocktail party, and uh, somebody's passing uh, hors d'oeuvres around, and they pass uh, they pass some pickles, or they pass a hot dog. Uh, little hot dog in a blanket and you don't do anything they come <laughs> they come by with a shrimp and you grab it sandy's in <laughs> and it's the same thing it's just it just all of a sudden it was in the right spot at the right time and they, they it was an impulse what was it like for you to win that gold cup you know among all these icons and you know you were kind of not late to the game but it was so important for you what what would that mean to you <laughs> well it, it was um uh, it was huge. Yeah, it was right here. Yeah, it's like <clears throat> you aspire to do something. You train for it. And when I say train people, no, you're just going fishing. You know, no, you're training. Right. You're training physically. You're training mentally. Um, uh, you, you practice, you practice, and um, you don't fall into it. Nobody falls into that. Nobody picks up a fly rod and casts it. You know, yeah. some pick it up faster than others, but you don't just pick one up and and be able to do the things that you needed to do <clears throat> to outperform other people. And and I've, I've always um, I felt like the the competitive end of fly fishing here has opened up the entire um, spectrum of how to do it and how to make it happen. Um, it, it, it's when the same people win the same event over and over again, or in the top four or five, something like that, it's the same people. They're doing something right. They're doing something right. They're not being lucky more often, but right. they're making their luck. They're making their own luck more often. Right. Um, but, uh, there's a lot of satisfaction to it. Well, you've won the Gold Cup three times and the Fall Fly, the biggest uh, bonefish tournament in the world, five times. Yeah. Uh, which is 
better or if there is such a thing or just apples to oranges what's your favorite tournament um, and your favorite success i moved here because of the bonefish <laughs> yeah i'm i'm i Isla Morada was it because of the bonefish. And that that was what put it over the top. This was the <clears throat> the classiest bonefishing I've ever seen. I mean, you and I have been to the Seychelles and and uh, uh, fished the Bahamas and fished uh, Yucatan, Belize, and other places and, and everything. But there was no classier bonefishing than, than right here, where you could have you could have a big bonefish tail and two or three fish together or a single, a big single, and um, and cast this fish and, and hook a 12-pound fish, 14-pound fish, whatever. I remember, I remember a, uh, a bonefish tournament with uh, Al Polofsky. We were at Twin Key, and there were two bonefish, two bonefish tailing. We were just on the, uh, uh, the north side of Twin Key. And uh, had one of those snapping shrimp, one of Chico's brown <laughs> snapping shrimp. And uh, I threw fly in front of him, and I could see his dorsal fin do one of these little zigzag. Bumped it a couple times, hooked the fish, caught the fish. He weighed uh, 12-1. We put him in the, the live well. And that year was the first year that, we had done live wells that Al Pulaski the year before had said, we've got to stop killing these fish. You should get a hundred point bonus if you release them alive. So everybody put live wells in the next year. Nobody ever killed another bonefish. And so we run him in, we weigh him 12, one. And, uh, we took him out, released him, got back in the boat, went right back to the same spot. There's not two fish. Now there's only one in the exact same spot. I made another cast, hook the fish, brown snapping shrimp, brought it twelve four. Crazy. Only in back to back cast over twelve pounds. I, I don't know any place like that. No. There's no. never been a place like that. The my very first tournament I fished, no, my second, I fished the spring bonefish, but the fall fly I fished with Harry Spear. Very similar in that we were on Shell Key. And I hadn't really fished shell, shell key very much, but lines in at seven. We see these f these few fish tailing. We go over and we catch one. First cast of the day, throw it in the live well. It turns out to be like 10, 12. We're pulling off shell key flat, get to the channel. And Harry looks up to the heavenly godfather is up there, you know, and says, if this is going to be a perfect world, we got we could we could catch a 12 pound fish. Well, right then we saw these two tailing bone fish. He spins the boat, we go over. <laughs> And catch a thirteen twelve, <laughs> but that went on for years and years and years. Years and years, yeah, unbelievable. That was in ninety six. Yeah, yeah, and that that was getting toward the end. I guess the early two thousand is when the the fish apparently um, we stopped getting recruitment of juvenile fish. And the bonefish that were here, the big guys, they got old and they died. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're, we'll get into the conservation in a second here. But let's go back to the tournaments. I think one of the most exciting um, aspects of the tournaments in the early years, and Steve Huff has always said, every guide has got to gaff a fish at some point in his life. You know, obviously that, that, that mentality has changed. But back in the day, you had some pretty exciting – Boat rides with uh, trophy winning oh. fish. <laughs> Tell me your most mem the most memorable one of a gaffing, and I think you oh, made gaffing. You may I think you may gravitate to well, he got seven the fish. mile bridge. He got the fish, and I got him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's one of the great stories of all time. <laughs> now, I've got a picture around here somewhere, uh, but um, we were fishing, and and actually Steve. Steve was the first guide that really traveled from here, that, that made a, a run. Loggerhead at the time was, um, I want to say it was an hour and 50 minutes in the boat we were riding in at the time. <clears throat> it, was a, it was a good hour and 50 minutes to get to Loggerhead if you went straight there. And... Um, 
And the logic was that the fish are always, they're all weight fish. There's not a bunch of little fish there. Um, and they weren't pressured a lot. So we would run a loggerhead. And um, uh, we hooked a fish. Uh, it was a pretty good fish. It was a, I think it was the biggest one I ever caught in a gold cup. It was 139 and a half. And uh, I had it on for about 15 minutes. And Steve... This reminds me of another time too. <laughs> Steve, Steve reached over. Um, he would start sharpening his gaff. <laughs> I'm sitting there. Finally, we're getting the fish under control a little bit, and he's. I hear him in the back. He's sharpening the gaff. Then he takes his watch off. He always takes his watch off. And uh, next thing you know, he's there. He reaches over and he hits the fish. And next thing you know, the fish snatches him right out of the boat. And um, I kind of pulled both of them back over to the boat. <laughs> and, I, and Steve holds the end of the gaff up. He says, here, here, get the handle of the gaff. I grab the gaff and start to lift up on it. And unfortunately, it was gone through the tarpon, but it also went through part of his forearm right here. So you got them both on so the gaff. So I got them both. <laughs> so, so, so that was pretty... Uh, pretty sporty and knowing steve he probably just you know put some sort of a handkerchief or, or tied it around there and started That's exactly pulling. what we did go I, get another one it was probably a boat rag is what it was, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it was a boat rag and then we, one day we were uh fishing at uh key west bank seven mile bridge and um uh you could you could fish this bank and the fish would would um lay right off the deep edge of it and they would roll you'd see the fish roll and he would go right back to the bottom in that spot so you didn't see the fish but you knew exactly where he was and you could throw a cast out there and you put a mend in it and just swing the fly and bump it just a little bit and you hooked up so so we hooked this fish and the fish went violent he he just he went berserk jumping and pounding himself and in about four minutes he stunned himself <laughs> and steve had already gone back to start getting a gaff probably landed upside down he's all dizzy laying there yeah he hit yeah and and i said steve i think we're gonna get a shot about that time steve comes by and he reaches over and he sticks his fish fish was maybe 90 pounds it wasn't a monster snatched him out of the water but we had drifted into the channel, and the water was like 15 feet deep. <laughs> so, so Steve disappears. Steve has a, a, he had a rope he put on the end of his gaff, so he's roped to the gaff. So he can't let go. He's, he's, he can let he's go, but, he ain't, <laughs> but the gaff's not going right, anywhere. Right, right. Yeah, so he says, he, says he, he remembers... He was trying to hold it so his gla his glasses would stay mashed against his face under water, and then he said the fish started going up, and he could feel the fish going up, and he's thinking to himself, "This fish is going to jump." <laughs> so, so the fish did. The fish fish got it, jumped, cleared the water, came back down, and that was it. And I idled over to him and picked him up. And there were some guys that were bait fishing in a boat right there. And they hollered over and says, wow, that was great. We'd like to see that again. <laughs> <laughs> and Steve said, your turn, right? <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, that was, that was pretty slick. Um, what, what has changed in this whole game that we play most radically as far as the techniques and the, the equipment? Um, obviously, back then the hooks, the the wire was so much thicker; they didn't penetrate very well. The rods were pretty, you know, limber. Yeah. Uh, what do you think the the greatest improvement has been in, in, with the equipment in the more recent years? Well, like you said, the hook the hook has been huge. The reason that we used um, such big hooks, we used four O's and five O's. You had to sharpen them forever. You spent half your life sharpening them. Uh, sharpening flies and you had always had holes punched in your thumb from using the file on them 
um, and triangulating them. But today, the laser-sharpened hook points and the wire is so strong for its uh, diameter. Size. Right. So now a lot of the hooks are on, um, a lot of the flies are ties on one, one o. Oh, Two O's a big hook these days for tarpon. Right, right. And um, so the hooks have been huge. The rod material and the design of the rods is just huge. If you're taking everybody, we've always used nine foot rods pretty much for tarpon. So you use nine foot rod, but if if it has so much flex that it it, it goes like this. Then that fly is only traveling four and a half feet away from you when you have a right hand wind. Right. And right. for some reason, the wind's always on your right hand. <clears throat> so now you have a rod that's a little stiffer. It gives you the same feel, but now that flies two and a half more feet away from you. So I find people get hooked a lot less and hooking yourself. I mean, I can't, I've hooked myself casting at fish. You know, quite a few times over the years, right. and um, and other people, uh, you know, get hooked. <laughs> right. Um, so that that's been very big. The the reels, bar stock anodized aluminum, the large arbor has been huge. That's the biggest improvement in fly reels in the history of fly reels. The the moving moving the diameter of uh, of one revolution of line. Right. The pickup speed. The, the pickup speed. Yeah. That's huge. How do you feel about tournaments? Um, tell me about the transition from tournaments. Uh, I hate to go backwards just for a second, because you have really made uh, a, a big impact with conservation recently. But tell me about the uh, the period of time when the, the tarpon were no longer being killed uh, to win these Gold Cup events. And tell me about, you know, the conversations about, you know, the docks around here. Now they're all so well protected. Back in the day, everything was hanging high. All the marinas had dead tarpon hanging on hooks. The tournaments had dead tarpon at the docks. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I would say the, the from from what I remember <clears throat> was the science or the, uh, the information available at the time, there were five to 8,000 tarpon killed in Florida every year. A, a big tarpon. So, just for vanity. Yeah, yeah, it was vanity. Uh, all over the state, people, got, especially fishing guides, uh, it's just was the culture. It, it was nothing ill about it, but the, they would catch a tarpon for their client. Uh, people thought they had to have the tarpon to mount it, uh, they wanted a mount. And then they would hang the tarpon up on the dock back at uh, where the boat stayed, Bud Mary's or Whale Harbor or wherever, the Lorelei, wherever it was. They'd hang the tarpon up. So people coming by that afternoon say, oh, God, I want to do that tomorrow. So it was like an advertisement. It was right. uh, it was like a Facebook ad. <laughs> uh, How to, hard was it to get them to all come to, you know, the same agreement like we're going to catch and release these fish? Well, there was an argument. There was two schools of thought, and um, there were some guys that were epic. Uh, Eddie Whiteman. Uh, Causey, uh, maybe? Charlie Causey? Charlie Causey, Eddie Whiteman, Steve, uh, Hank Brown, Jimmy Albright. Um, uh, we we got to stop killing these things. We, can, we can't do this. We can't do this anymore. It makes no sense. And... Um, um, so we got the uh, Florida Fish and Game Wildlife <clears throat> to propose regulation um, to make it illegal to kill one. And uh, you had to buy a tag. Uh, but there were a lot of people that didn't want to do that. And so they wanted the tarpon tournament to continue to buy tags and to be able to kill kill tarpon. Um and uh, finally, they saw it. And they quit. So the the Hawley tournament was the first one that went all release, and the Gold Cup right away, the same same thing. Um, later, the Golden Fly almost started to continue to kill them, but they turned around. Um, so the only 
kill tournaments. Uh, there was one up around uh, Tampa that they stopped a few years ago, Boca Grande. They quit killing them in that one a, a right. year or two ago. They said they weren't killing them, but they were killing them. They were dragging them somewhere. Right. Right. And they were killing them, and they were using a, they were snagging them with some kind of. It was a coom pop, yeah. Uh, yeah. And then in Louisiana, they still have some kill tournaments. Did you ever feel bad for the fish? Huh? In the early years of the Gold Cup, did you ever feel bad for the fish when you'd gaff them and throw them in the boat? I don't think I would have. No. It was, it, was, it was okay back then. Yeah, there wasn't anything to it. And it, But as it got to the recent point, um, so we, we can't do this to the fishery. It's not the right thing to yeah, do. Right. And, what uh, about what about record fishing? How do you feel about guys who are willing to to kill it? Let's just say the world record now is Holland's 202. Can somebody, how would you feel about somebody killing a 205 for a record? Uh, good for them. Good, good for them. I don't, I don't, I don't it's know. It's one fish. Right? Yeah. You know what? The records are so unattainable anymore. I mean, what do you got, a, a 202? On you got 20. A 202 on 20, 194 on 12, 191 on 16. Yeah. Uh, eight pound is 127. They're all, and the four pound is 123. Yeah. So uh, the, the, the smaller fish are available, but 220 pound fish are not available. Right. They're not readily available. And, uh, and it, you have to buy the tag. So where they were killing five or 8,000 tarpon a year, but kill four? Yeah, if that. If that. And yeah. they kill four, if that. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and it's not having any impact whatsoever on the population. At all. At all. There's, I, there's, I, there's zero it's impact. A, I feel it's a personal thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you've been uh, tell me about uh, now or never glades uh, and the stuff that you've been involved with over the last number of years. You know, the um, you yeah. know the, the course of history shows that the Everglades have have been uh, basically starting out a long, long time ago when they made it a national park, and then uh, they changed it. Uh, Congress changed it. I think it was in ni- nineteen thirty. Um, Maybe a little bit after that. I think it became a park in 40, it's 47. 47. It's 47. But then shortly thereafter, it was changed so they could drain it and develop real estate and all that. Yeah. Tell me your perspective on all that and, and the impact you've made because it's been tremendous. Uh, and maybe a little bit about Monty Burke's article in Garden and Gun. <laughs> you know, talking about uh, chronological uh, the years of the Everglades and the fresh water and the lack of fresh water and what you've done. Well, yeah. It, it, I mean, this has been the story of Florida. The story of Florida is here's a swamp. Let's drain it. And and uh, and then we'll have a paradise. We can all live here, and but it's not. It's about the water. It's all. It's about the water. We have a an estuary. We have a river. I have a river that starts at um, just below uh, Disney World, and it flows through Lake Okeechobee, um, and and then it flows through the central. Uh, prairie, the Everglades, and down through and out into Florida Bay. So you have an estuary and a rain machine in the summer. In the summer, the the um, the landmass gets hot during the day, and this heat rises, and it sucks in the humidity from both oceans, from the ocean and the Gulf, and this humidity is the heat brings it up higher and higher every afternoon it reaches a certain height it condenses it gets cold and falls down and congregates into rain so we're pulling water from the ocean or humidity from off the ocean to gather converting it to rain that falls in the state of florida fresh water creating an estuary which is the richest environment on the planet there's nothing richer than an estuary. So this is one of the great ones on the planet. But right away, people started um, uh, trying to drain it. 
uh, drain it so we have more land, so we can build more roads, so we can have houses. The Mackle Brothers, a huge subdivision over on the West Coast, uh, cut canals and drain it and then build a, a dam around the south side of Lake Okeechobee and stop the flow of water. So what we did is we created a blockage, just like if you had a blockage in your artery above your heart and you stop the water from flowing into the heart of Florida, South Florida, the estuary, the Everglades, and um, you just stop that water. And then, then on top of that, you had a certain industry, the sugar industry primarily, a couple families that were dominant in the sugar industry beginning after, um, after Castro took over and they left Cuba. And politically, they became so strong because of their ability to donate and lobby and receive um, uh, receive favors or whatever from the government, subsidies, uh, and it's very complicated. But basically, we paid the sugar industry and, and they were able to manipulate the water. They were able to control the water as a private irrigation system. For themselves. And that's what they did. They, they no longer cared about the environment or anything. All they cared about is they have enough water when they want it. And if they had too much water, they could get it, get rid of it. And it became a big plumbing issue. They, they control the South Florida Water Management District. Um, and it reached a point, um, I heard somebody say that sometimes the best thing that can happen is a tragedy. And we had a tragedy when it reached a point where we dumped all this blue green algae out both coast. We had a lot of water. The Corps of Engineers was worried that the levee was going to break. So they dumped the water out to the Gulf in the Atlantic where it never should have gone. It should have come south through the through the Everglades and been filtered through the marsh. And it created these algae blooms that destroyed millions of fish and tons of biomass and manatees and sea turtles and shrimp and everything. Uh, it destroyed businesses. It put people out of business. Uh, it made people sick. Um, it killed their dogs. And um, and people just got fed up and said, you know what, this is not right. These people cannot continue to be selfish and control this environment, which belongs to the people of the state of Florida. And um, I, 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 I am blunt about it. Dude. Rick Scott was for sure an environmental disaster. He stripped away the uh, Department of Environmental Regulation. He he uh, uh, planted a horrible uh, water management district. Um, had policies in place uh, that accelerated the degradation, and uh, uh, so you had different organizations that came together. It was uh, the Everglades Foundation has been around for years. The Everglades Trust, Bonefish and Tarpon and Trust have been involved. One that came on uh, very strong a few years ago was Bull Sugar. I got involved in it. Bull Sugar was very capable of using social media and ended up with 300,000 followers on Facebook. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And they were able to spread the truth. And they were very blunt about it. A lot of politicians didn't like them. But people began to realize that we've been lied to. We've been lied to. We've been uh, misled. Outright misled and lied to by the government agencies under under um, under Scott, and um, so what I got involved in was saying, "Look, we know we need an outlet on the south side of Lake Okeechobee. We know we need the water to come back. We need to put a stent in this artery that we blocked up." So 
So that's what we need to do. We, and we, we said, okay, pass this legislation, build a, a outlet on the south side, build a reservoir, build filtration marshes, stop the discharges out the, the east and the west, Calusa Hatchie and the St. Lucie, and bring the water south through the Everglades. So we were able to put together a coalition of people that agreed to this. We know we all need to do this. A million things we need to do, but we all know we need to do this. And we pushed that through. We pushed that legislation through. It was watered down. It was not as strong as it could have been, but it was a big start. And it put our foot in the door. And we're well on the way. The guy DeSantis, I don't know whether he's an environmentalist or I don't really care. If he understands that water is a success or the, the, the reason that Florida is going to be financially successful and have a tourist industry and, and be a, a good place to live, I don't care whether it's he likes the trees and the flowers. But he knows that has to be done. Well, one of the first moves he did, which was very impressive, is he asked for the resignation of all the, the board members that Scott had put into place. He, yes, he asked for resignation, and he's completely replaced those people. Right. And, and, the, and the board that he currently has is is based basing their decisions on science. And, um, uh, and So there is hope. Yeah, yeah. There, no, I'd, I would say— Look, this should have been completed 10 years ago, okay? If we get some of this done by the end of 10 more years, I'd say we're doing great. But they've raised the Tamiami Trail, and they're raising more of it to let the water go through. The, uh, they're, <clears throat> they're starting work on the reservoir. The federal government is way behind them bellying up with the money. The state of Florida is putting the money up. State of Florida vote. Every time the state has a referendum, they vote to do this. The people in Florida want it. They want it. Our state legislatures, uh, le legislators by and large have been either misinformed or negligent or torn in their loyalties to take care of this. Tell me about what you see in Florida Bay. You know, we were talking earlier about, you know, this issue, lack of fresh water getting down into Florida Bay. Um, talk about, you know, a number of years ago and the water salinity and what you were seeing out in your backyard. Yeah, well, well, it's changing. It's, it's changing. Florida Bay became um, um, very salty. You, you remember when um, Buttonwood Canal, before they had a dam there, well, the idea of that dam was to stop the fresh water flow and spread it so that it would spread. Whether that did anything or not, I don't think there was enough water coming, still coming, right. uh, to do anything. But um, Florida Bay's changed. Um, I remember when I first started fishing, it, it was very salty. And... Um, uh, you would see sheep's head, thousands and thousands and thousands of sheep's head all over Florida Bay. Uh, every every uh, mangrove root or every stump that was there it had sheep's head all over. You don't see them anymore. And they were more saline. They wanted more salinity. And then um, we haven't put the fresh water back. We haven't put the fresh water back, and that was the primary reason we had the algae bloom in 15, I think it was. Right. So that killed probably 40,000 acres. Of grass. Of seagrass, right. yeah. Um, it's coming back. Um, but you know what's interesting? You know, just recently, now we're seeing, I know there was a big window of time where there were not that many bonefish around here. We had a big freeze. Red fishing was gone, non-existent. But it's amazing to see how great the red fishing is again. It's so resilient. We, we, you've got, we've got a unique thing. We've got the Gulf, Gulf of Mexico. We've got the Atlantic Ocean, and you have this wash that that is the water. tide. Yeah, the tides change and brings new water to us. Yeah, you have this transition, 
And then if you'd get a no more fresh water coming through, it would recreate that estuary and the grass could come back. At the same time, we're dealing with the fact that the water's getting deeper. And um, I don't know what the cause of it is. I don't, I'm not a scientist, but I know that the water's getting deeper. I can look in my backyard and know that over the years, the water has gotten deeper. People talk about king tides now. They're strong. They're yeah. they're moon tides. They're, Global warming is alive and well. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it is, uh, the water's getting deeper. If it's because the polar caps are melting, then yeah, that's sure. global warming. That's a given. How do you feel about Isla Mirada now after all these years? It's still for me, Sandy. I know you live here. You've seen the evolution and the change like I have with the ski area of Aspen back in 1960. There are not very many people. Now there are a lot of people. But I realized, too, that in Aspen, these are the good old days. You can fall and a binding will come off. You don't have to break your leg and you're warm when you're up there. In fly fishing, I see, you know, from 30 years ago, we are still catching as many fish because the sophistication is so much better. Yeah, it's crowded out there, but we're smarter and we're better. Yeah. But I can't imagine how you feel after being here for so many years, and now you see this influx of people and the busyness that you see. Well, <laughs> you know what? Um, the weight of humanity is heavy on beautiful places all, all over the world. I mean, I go to, um, I was in Bozeman, Montana a few months ago, and I said, Whoa, I hadn't been there for several years. I said, how did this happen? <laughs> it's like a metropolitan area. And yet you go over to Livingston, 30 miles away, and it's like it was before us. I mean, years ago, it wasn't overpopulated like that. But but this is such easy access. It's, it's, it's easy. You don't need a passport. It's... Um, uh, you got hotels, you got restaurants, so you have a lot of people that just want to be in a beautiful place. And thank goodness for the Everglades National Park and the boundary. And thank goodness for the complexity of the flats and how unforgiving they are if you don't know what you're doing out there. And, um, uh, but today, you can get in the boat. We could go throw the boat in the water right now. We could go throw the boat in the water, and we could run for 30 minutes, and we can fish the rest of the afternoon and not see another boat. How beautiful is that? <laughs> Do you think you're, you're, what you've done with Now or Neverglades Foundation and your, and your voice with conservation, do you think this has been your, last, your, your best hour? <laughs> the greatest thing you've ever done? Yeah. I think. Yeah. <laughs> You're a great pal, Sandy. It's worn me out. I see this. <laughs> I'm going to go enjoy it. You know what? You've got a great heart. You've brought so much to this game. Uh, through all your successes, the school, your voice, and your vision, I can say honestly say you have been a hero to many of us. Thank, Thank you. you, sir. Thank you. It's a small game. It's a small, small group of people that love this. And I know, I know enough about it to fix it. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> when I saw its West Side Story, when I saw it's just a road.